I do have to ask, is the mitochondria the powerhouse of the cell? I think all listeners will want to know the answer to that question. Yeah, I'll start with that one first. So, you know, it's so funny. So, yeah, mitochondria are sort of the main muse or inspiration of my laboratory's research. Um, And, yeah, out of all of the cellular components, all of what we call these organelles, they by far have the best marketing team (laughs) because they came up with this catchphrase that is burned into everyone's brain everyone yeah Yeah, it's almost like a cultural phenomenon i think so there are like memes on the internet like you know i don't know how i didn't learn how to do my taxes (laughs) in high school but i know the mitochondria is the power and you're like that's more important (laughs) but i have to say if i were on the marketing and rebranding team Mm -hmm. for Mm -hmm. mitochondria i might switch up their catchphrase a little bit. Um, So we call them the powerhouse of the cell because they generate energy, the currency, the the cellular energy currency called ATP. But we now appreciate that they do a lot more for Mm -hmm. the cell. And they're now sort of people are changing, not just me, but others are sort of changing their catchphrase to something like the stress sensor or the signaling hub, or I think I even saw Someone called them like the CEO um, oh, I have <laughs> of not the heard cell. That one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is not my original. I, I wish I could knew who to give credit to on that one. <laughs> <laughs> someone else on the marketing team. Yes, yeah, someone yeah. else on the marketing team. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, um, so what's really fascinating about them is what we're starting to appreciate is that they're a central hub to receive different um, signaling inputs from the cell. And then they make these critical decisions of of how the cell should respond. And in particular, what's even cooler about mitochondria is that a lot of its ability to respond to different stress signaling pathways has to do with its ability to change shape. So they're they're like these like (laughs) shape-shifting entities inside the cell. So they can divide, they can fuse together, they can divide just parts of them. Like if they have a damaged part, they can selectively get rid of that. They can be transported all over. So they're just, they're very dynamic. So yeah, we've talked a lot about, you know, the form of mitochondria and the structure of mitochondria. But how do, how have you found that mitochondria implicate things like disease or kind of the inner workings of the cell? Totally. Um, yeah, I mean, we would probably need like two hours to go over <laughs> to all of unpack. it. <laughs> yeah, it turns out mitochondria are implicated in so many aspects of cell health and because of that also in disease. Um, so, you know, just to narrow down the, the, the things that my lab are interested, uh, my lab is interested in. Um, one, as you mentioned, or as I mentioned before, there's this, uh, self fate aspect Mm -hmm. about mitochondria. And so that's really important for diseases such as neurodegeneration, Mm -hmm. where you have mitochondria thought to play a role in the, um, neuronal cell death process. And so a lot of uh, neurodegeneration at the heart of it is basically act- overactivation of pathways that lead to premature neuronal cell death. Um, on the flip side, you have diseases like cancer, where the pathology or the detrimental aspects of cancer are that you have uncontrolled cell growth. Mm-hmm. So you have these two sort of very groups of devastating diseases where one of them, on the one hand, you have where you want to preserve the life of, of cells. And on the other, you want to control the division and sort of control that um, program cell mm-hmm. death aspect. And mitochondria are sort of play a role in, in both. Right. But we don't quite understand how their function ultimately leads to these very distinct outcomes. Mm-hmm. And... One thing that's similar is if you look inside of, for example, cancer cells, and if you look inside of, um, for example, tissue from a patient that uh, suffered a, a neurodegenerative disease such as Alzheimer's, what you find in both of them is that the mitochondria are very fragmented. They're very small. So there's like this hyperactivation of the division, or we call it the fission pathway. Mm-hmm. So, you know, 
that's confusing. Right, <laughs> that because they are two different fates, two different outcomes. Two, two right. different outcomes. And so something must be very different about the interactions that mediate the division of mitochondria where in cancer as opposed to a neurodegeneration. Mm-hmm. And so, okay, so that's interesting aspect number one. But it turns out that even in just a normal healthy cell, mitochondria are constantly dividing, fusing. I mean, and that's just a normal part. So it's not like, you know, dividing mitochondria automatically equals disease. I mean, that's right. a part of their function. Right. And it turns out we don't even really understand how mitochondria divide, even in a healthy situation, even in a normal functioning cell. And so what my lab is interested in doing is looking at all these different contexts, both in healthy states, Mm -hmm. as well as in, for example, patient-derived cell lines or different models of disease um, in cell culture to understand what is this machinery that helps mitochondria divide. And by understanding sort of what it looks like, how it assembles, how everything interacts on that very detailed level, Mm -hmm. both in healthy samples as well in these two very distinct disease states, we might be able to understand what areas we can eventually target or to halt the progression of this from happening. 